Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Paul's writing and he says, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not that the scripture saith of Elias, how he makes intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God to him? I've reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time also, there is a remnant, a remnant according to the election of grace. All of us, I think, really enjoy a story where there's a conflict between a strong opponent and a weak underdog when the underdog wins. I mean, you remember the Rocky movies? Da-da-da, da-da-da. Da, da. yeah. Anyway, you know, Rocky was always getting beat senseless, you know. And then all of a sudden, man, what a comeback. Well, the world is about to experience the greatest comeback story ever told. And I want you to listen for just a few minutes this morning. As we're reading this scripture in Romans 11, the Bible talks about a remnant, a remnant. Webster's Dictionary defines remnant as this, the part of something that's left when the other parts are gone, a fragment or a scrap. Now, most people would take issue with being called a fragment or a scrap or leftover, but uh, those are the ones that God always uses. Those are the ones that God always takes to change the world. In this letter that, uh, that Paul's writing, he's referring to Elijah. And he's talking about this conversation between God and Elijah. And Elijah is saying, God, there's nobody left but me. I am it. When I'm gone, you can just forget it. There's nobody left on earth that's worshiping you. And God says something to the effect, oh, shut up. I've got 7,000 left. Well, not, he wasn't quite that rough on him. But he says, Calm down. There's 7,000 that haven't turned away from me. Now, if you remember this story, Israel had turned away from God. They had gone after Baal. I mean, they were worshiping idols. They were into paganism. Uh, they were into child sacrifice. It was a rough time in the history of Israel. And God spoke to Elijah and told him to have a confrontation. First of all, he told him to make a proclamation that it wouldn't rain until he said so. And it didn't, and everything dried up. And the king had a bounty on his head because he just knew that Elijah was the one that had cursed Israel. Well, he was at God's command. So after that time period, three and a half years go by, God speaks to Elijah and he says, go and show yourself to the king and tell him that he's going to send rain on the earth. And Elijah goes back and he talks to King Ahab and then he gathers the people together and they go up on Mount Carmel. And Elijah says, listen to me. It's time that you people decide who you're going to worship. Nobody said a thing. And Elijah said, Here's, let's do this. Let's prepare us some altars here. And all you priests of Baal, you put your sacrifice on the altar. And put the wood under the altar, but don't strike a match. And I'll do the same thing. And the God that answers by fire, igniting that offering, he's going to be God. And we'll all serve him. And the people said, Absolutely. Right on. That's the thing we're going to do. Sounds good to us. And if you remember that account, there's uh, a lot of hoop de la going on, and uh, they're all jumping up and down and screaming and yelling and praying to Baal and saying, Okay, Baal, rain down some fire for us here and show this crazy man that you're truly God. And it went on most of the day. And the only thing that happened was the priest got hoarse and the people got tired. Nothing. So, at the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah comes and he prepares everything. He puts the sacrifice in the wood. And then he adds a little extra. He says, fellas, get all the water you can find and soak it. So they wet everything down. And the Bible says the water was so much that it just filled up a trench around the altar. Everything is soaking wet. And Elijah said, Lord, I want you to show these people that you've turned their hearts back to you. 
that you're the one true God. And God rained fire from heaven, ignited the altar, ignited the sacrifice, and even the water around it. And the people fell on their face and said, yeah, that's God. So here this one man, used by God, turned the course of his nation. God didn't call for an army. God called one man. One man. Now, the conversation that Paul is quoting took place after this. After this great, you know, uh, underdog championship that we're talking about this morning, the queen says, who was the real advocate of worshiping Baal in the country, said, I'm going to have you put to death because what you've done to my priests and on and on and on. So Elijah flees and he's hiding in a cave and God begins to speak to him. And he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he said this. He said, Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've dug down your altars. And I'm the only one left. And they're seeking after my life. And that's when God says, listen, I've still got 7,000. I still have this remnant in Israel. Don't panic. Don't panic. And what Elijah didn't realize, and the Bible doesn't say this, but I believe it. I believe that the victory that Elijah experienced was because of the prayers of the 7,000 that were crying out to God and saying, Lord, turn this nation back to you. Because if there were 7,000 people still worshiping the true God, you know they were praying for revival in Israel. So God's remnant turned the course of history. All through the Word of God, as you study you'll find out that God uses the remnant, the leftover, the ones that are left when everybody else went in some other direction, the ones that people didn't place a lot of stock in. One of my favorite examples is the army of Gideon. You remember that story probably. Another time in Israel's history when Israel had turned away from God and God was allowing them to be punished and allowing them to suffer at the hands of the Midianites and the Amorites and others so these people would move in about the time of harvest and they would just be like grasshoppers and they would consume all the harvest that Israel had brought forth and the Bible says that this young man named Gideon was out threshing some wheat and he was hiding it away at the wine press and the angel of God appeared to him and said how's it going you mighty man of valor and Gideon looks around to see who's standing behind him because he knew he was not a mighty man of valor and the angel said, yeah, I'm talking to you. You know, you go in this your strength and you're going to deliver Israel. And Gideon immediately begins this conversation kind of like Elijah's and said, now, wait a minute. If God's with us, why has all this happened to us? Where's all the miracles that he's talking about? And why me? Because I am the least of my father's house and my father's house is the least in Israel. Gideon knew his abilities and they were practically nil. But God continued to speak to him, and he said, I will be with you. So the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he began to blow a trumpet and call for people to come. 32,000 came. That was pretty impressive. This one little kid goes out and starts hooping and hollering and saying, we're going to go against the enemies of God. 32,000 people came. There was a problem. God looked at him and said, this number's not right. Gideon said, I know what you're talking about. There's 100,000 of them. We got 32,000. And God said, no, no, you're, you're thinking wrong. So God says, okay, we're going to sort this thing out. And 31,700 went home. 300 people left against well over 100,000 Midianites, Amorites, and several other ites. And God begins to deal with Gideon and begins to show him his power. And God took the remnant of 300 and defeated all that massive army and changed the course and delivered his nation. God uses the remnant. On down in Israel's history, again, Israel had turned away from God. Well, I tell you, I'm so glad that God is a God of amazing grace and second chances and third and fourth and fifth. You just keep reading Israel's history. Anyway, they'd turned away from God again. And this time, to really get their attention, God had allowed them to be taken captive. And they were down in Babylon. And while they were in Babylon, 
King Nebuchadnezzar decided one day that he was going to unify the religions. So he makes this golden, the Bible refers to it as an image. It's, it's, it's a, it, evidently it was like a pillar because the Bible says it was nine feet wide and 90 feet tall and it was made of gold. And it was set there on the plain of Durham. The king says, okay, here's the thing. When the, the music starts, everybody will fall down and worship. It was an attempt at a one world religion. He said, I'm going to cure all this arguing between one religion and another. He said, we're all going to worship this. And the day came at the dedication of this golden column. And the music starts. And all you can see is the backsides of thousands of people. With the exception of three. And there's these three weirdos that are standing there. And they're not bowing down. And everybody comes running and says, did you see? Did you see? You know, everybody was telling on these boys. And the king calls them in. And he says, is it true that you didn't bow down and worship with everybody else? Now, I'll give you one more chance. If you do, okay, we'll forget it. If you don't, it's into the oven. And they said, well, we don't really have to think about an answer. Because our God tells us that he is the only one that we can worship. He's the only one worthy of our worship. And he will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to do this. We're not going to des desecrate his promise. We're not going to worship something that is inanimate, something that has no power, something that is nothing. Well, of course, that didn't sit well with him. So he had them thrown in the furnace. And the furnace was so hot it killed the fellows that threw him in, threw them in. And then he looks in. He says, now, check me here. How many did we throw in? And they said, well, there were three of them. He said, why do I see four? And the fourth one looks like the Son of God. I kind of like that old song that says they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, and they wouldn't burn. So they says, if you guys don't mind, would you step out of the heat for a minute? And they come out, and the Bible says there's not even a smell of smoke. And the king says, well, I know who God is now, and it's not this post I set up. God used a remnant of three to take the most powerful king on earth and turn his heart. God always uses a remnant. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, and he began to walk through Israel. The Bible says he went out to a mountain and he prayed all night. Now for the Jewish people, night was from six in the evening till six in the morning. So he goes up in the mountain and he prays for 12 hours. And when he comes down, he chooses 12 disciples. That means he prayed an hour for each one of them. And you know, I can almost picture him up there, Father, who do you want me to pick? Who is the absolute best for this job of being with me and carrying this gospel and telling people that the kingdom is at hand? Lord, help me to choose. And he comes down and he chooses. And you know what? He doesn't choose the finest from the rabbinical schools. He doesn't choose the greatest and the, and the most honored of the Jewish hierarchy. He chooses tax collectors and fishermen and political zealots and traitors. Now, you would think that praying one hour for each one, he could have made better choices. Here's what I think. I think he said, Father, help me not to choose as the world chooses. Help me not to look at people as the world looks at people. But God, help me to choose the ones that you want to use to carry this gospel, to show the power of God. Don't, me, don't let me be a respecter of persons, but let me choose the ones that you choose to work through. 
And God chose a true remnant, the leftovers. And they went out and they preached. And sickness had to bow and demons had to flee. Ten days after Jesus went back to heaven, the Holy Spirit was poured out. And it was not poured out on everyone, but it was poured out on 120 people. And they went out, and the Bible says they turned the world upside down. God always uses a remnant. He doesn't go with the greatest and the finest. He takes just a small group of leftovers. People that are in one place while most of the world's going in a different direction. And he uses them to change the course of history. What are the characteristics of, of, of a remnant that God uses? Well, the first thing I think of when I think of the people that we've talked about this morning are people that know their own flaws and weaknesses. Gideon said, I'm the smallest. I'm the weakest. What do you mean, mighty man of valor? You know, those three Hebrew children that stood before the king probably said, you know, we don't have any power to do what we're doing here, but we're going to stand for what we believe. Those disciples knew what they were. They knew they were fishermen. They knew they were tax collectors, people that others didn't like. Everybody went in a different direction when they saw the tax collector coming. The political zealot, I mean, you know, only weirdos wanted to be around him anyway. Every one of these people knew their shortcomings. They, had, they, they didn't think they were something that they weren't. But God touched them. That's the thing. You see, the touch of God. You read through the Word of God, and especially during the ministry of Jesus Christ. And Jesus would go to someone and touch them, and their life would change, would be changed. And they would love him, and they would worship him. One account that just jumps out at me is when he goes to supper at the home of one of the religious leaders. And they're sitting there. And this woman comes in, and she kneels at the feet of Jesus, and she begins to weep and wash his feet and dry them with her hair. And, the, and this religious leader is just, oh, he was taken aback and he was put off. And he said to himself, if he knew what kind of woman this was, and evidently she had a reputation. If he knew what kind of woman this was, he would shove her away or command her to leave. He would not allow her to touch him being what she is. And Jesus says, Simon, I need to talk with you. And he said, okay, go ahead. He said, you know, I came into your house. And you didn't give me any water to wash my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. And here I am at your table. And this woman, ever since she came in, has not ceased to wash my feet and wipe them with the hairs of her head. And he said this, to whom much is forgiven, the same loves much. But to him, who little is forgiven, the same loves little. God uses the ones that know what they are, that have been touched by his amazing grace, forgiven by the blood of Jesus, that love him so much that they're not ashamed to call him Lord. The remnant, people that know their weakness, that know their faults, people that have been touched by God, People that are not ashamed to follow him or to be used by him. Now, let me tell you something. We live in a day much like many of those times in the history of Israel. A time when the majority have gone away. The majority are off doing their own thing. The majority are following their own pursuits or chasing some other philosophy, some other religion, some other something, or none at all. It's a time when the nation as a whole has turned away from God. We're a post-Christian nation, as scholars say. We've, we've, we've been defined by those in authority as a, as a non-Christian nation. Most people would agree with that. And a lot of times, 
Christians are like Elijah. Lord, I'm the only one left. There's nobody else. Everybody else has gone and left you and forgotten about you and wants to maintain no knowledge of you whatsoever. But God's saying to us the same thing he would say to him. Hey, I've got thousands that have not turned from me. I still have my remnant. And my remnant is about to change the course of history. I believe it with all my heart. The remnant that God is about to use are not the graduates of the finest seminaries. The remnants that God, the remnant that God is about to use are not the ones that you and I would choose if, even if we went and spent an hour each praying, probably. The remnant that God is about to use to change the course of history, I believe, will be former drug addicts, former alcoholics, zeros, people that the world places very little stock or hope in, but people that have been touched by God. There'll be people that the world calls nuts and radicals and fanatics and crazy. There'll be kids, young adults, and there'll be older people, but there'll all be folks that have been touched by God's grace, people that love him tremendously and full of the Holy Spirit and power. They're going to change the world. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You can read this in Joel 2 and Acts chapter 2. I'll summarize it for you. God says, I'll pour out my spirit. That's what's about to happen. And then he says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And then he says it again. I'll pour out my spirit. He says it twice. And then he says, I'll show wonders. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what's about to happen. And God's going to use a remnant to do it. The remnant is about to arise in the glory of God and change history. Now my question today is this. Are you part of the remnant? If you've been touched by God, if you love him, and if you're not ashamed to follow him and let him use you, then you are. And you can begin to rejoice because the greatest underdog victory in history is about to take place. God is about to do with that remnant what he's done back through history. In Israel's darkest hours, when they were furthest from God, God called a remnant. And the nation's history and the nation's direction was changed. And he will do it again. And he is, is doing it again. It's beginning. And I'm not ashamed to be called a part of the remnant, a scrap, a leftover. Because we're about to see what those scraps can do. Let me tell you, if you're here today and you don't know him, if you're here today and you've not acknowledged your sin to God, the need of a Savior, and you want to be part of this great underdog victory that's about to happen, it's a simple thing. All you have to do is pray and say, Father, I'm a sinner. I know it. You see, those are the ones that God loves to use, people that know what they are. People that think they're, they're special, people that think they're above certain things, people that think they're as good as anybody else, that's not who he's going to use. He's going to use those that know that they're trouble, that know that they've fallen flat on their face. People that have just sinned and, and God knows it and the world knows it and they know it and they're not trying to say otherwise. But those are the people also that God says, if you will come to me and confess that to me, I will forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and I'll make you part of my remnant that's about to arise and change history. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, I am so thankful that you don't use the smartest, you don't use the most educated, those that graduated magna cum laude, summa cum laude from the finest of the theological institutions. 
God, those are not the ones that you typically use to change history. It's the fishermen and the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the drug addicts and the thieves. The ones that nobody wants to live next door to. The ones that everybody says they're just a zero. They'll never be anything. They're the weakest. They're the smallest. They're the oldest. They're the youngest. They're the most feeble. But Lord, when your power comes, when your mercy and grace comes, then everything changes. And Lord, I know that you choose to use those very people. I know that you choose to use a remnant to show your glory. Because with Gideon, you said, I can't let you use 32,000 people because then you'll say you did it. But if you do it with 300, then you'll say God did it. And the same is true down through history. You always use those that will give glory and bring glory to you and not to themselves. So, Father, today, I thank you for every person in this room or listening by radio or watching by internet or television who have had a failure in their life who have made terrible mistakes, but have come to you and cried out to you for forgiveness and mercy, and you've touched them, and you've forgiven them. Lord, that's your remnant. I thank you for every one of them, Lord, that you're about to raise up and empower with the Holy Spirit that's going to change the course of families and communities and states and nations. You're about to do that. Because it's your promise. It shall come to pass. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. You're going to do it. You've repeated it and repeated it. And you're going to use a remnant. Father, I pray for those that are here today or listening or watching that have not come to you, have not acknowledged that sin before you and said, God, I am weak, I am helpless, and I'm hopeless. So I'm coming to you and saying, God, here I am. If you are there and if you will, I give my life to you and I ask you to forgive me because I want to be a part of your family. I want to be a part of that remnant. I want to be a part of what you're about to do in this earth. I want to be somebody and the only way I'm going to be somebody is in you. God, I pray that right now people will pray that prayer. Lord, forgive my sin. I believe Jesus is your son, that he came, lived, died, and rose again. That he's sitting beside you in heaven, interceding, praying. And I accept him as my Savior, and I give my life to him. God, I know if they'll pray that prayer, they'll be saved, forgiven, and made part of your remnant. As our heads are bowed today, if there's anyone here in this sanctuary that doesn't know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you're a part of God's remnant, a part of God's family, and that you want to know that today. While we're praying, while our heads are bowed, would you just lift your hand and say, God, I want to be a part. I want to be a part of what you're doing. I want to be a part of that remnant. I want to know. I want to know. I want to know. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Lord, right now you see every person, you see every heart, and I ask you to touch each one at their point of need. Lord, I pray that you confirm within them their relationship with you. God, I pray that you help them to know. And if they haven't truly received Jesus, let this be the moment that they open their heart and say, Lord, here I am, please come into my heart. I give my life to you. And I'm not going to be ashamed to be called yours. And I ask you, use me, use me. Because Lord, I want to see people set free. I want to see people saved. I want to see addictions broken. I want to see families healed. God, I want to see a nation turn back to you. So Lord, here we are. I thank you that you're going to use your remnant. And Lord, I ask you to bless each one today. Meet their need. Lord, whatever it is, you're the God of all grace and mercy and bounty. And Lord, you're a God that loves to give. So, Father, I pray that you give health where health is needed, strength where strength is needed, comfort where comfort is needed, encouragement, break chains. Lord, erase memories that are played over and over, 
that gender hurt and bitterness, heal past wounds. God, restore today. Fill with the Holy Spirit and cause your remnant to rise up and change the world. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you for this time in your presence. Go with us now and let us truly be the remnant of God. I ask it in Jesus' name and everybody said, Amen.